Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for coming out tonight to celebrate Judge Constance Baker Motley, a true champion of justice. I am Judge Shirley Troutman, and I will be presiding over the program this evening. I wish to begin the program by thanking the author, Tamiko Brown Nagan, for her inspiring biography of Constance Baker Motley, Civil Rights Queen. It is a book that further deepened my resolve to honor the judge at every opportunity that presents itself. And it is my hope that each of you will feel the same way at the conclusion of this program. I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we have in excess of 100 persons present virtually, and I thank them for taking the time to join us. We will now have remarks in the following order from the National Association of Women Judges, New York Chapter President, Judge Marsha Hirsch, followed by the co-chair of the Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission, Justice Troy Weber, and thereafter remarks from the president of the New York City Bar Association, Susan Coleman. And before I take my seat, this is Women's History Month, so look. <laughs> Good evening, and welcome to our Women's History Month celebration, a conversation on Constance Baker Motley, the Civil Rights Queen. As you heard, I'm Marsha Hirsch, the president of our New York chapter of the National Association of Women Judges, and our organization is proud to co-sponsor this event with the Franklin H. Williams Judicial Commission and the New York City Bar. The genesis of this program came from our Court of Appeals Associate Judge Shirley Troutman. She had received the book, Civil Rights Queen, Constance Baker Motley and the Struggle for Equality as a gift. She read it. She thought it would make a terrific program for our Women's History Month. I thought book chat, maybe 20, 30 people, Microsoft Teams, Shirley had a much bigger vision. That's why we're here tonight. Over 100 registered attendees in person, over 100 joining us online with a phenomenal panel, program book, video montage. So tonight, Constance Baker Motley's story will be shared throughout our state. And this amazing woman and her accomplishments will get the recognition she so richly deserves. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. I should unmute, right? I'm so used to like, everybody's like, you're <laughs> muted, you're muted. So I automatically like go up to some imaginary screen to like unmute. Okay. But anyhow, so apparently everybody speaks to Shirley. She told me about the book. I had to go out and get the book. I've read it through, I don't know how many times now. It's an awesome book. It's a little thick, but it's, it's a really, it's an awesome book. So I want to thank the National Association of Women Judges, the New York chapter, the New York City Bar Association uh, for their co-sponsorship of this program. Uh, the Franklin H. Williams Commission, as you probably know, was established in 1991. It is named after Franklin H. Williams. He was an American lawyer, civil rights activist. He, together with Thurgood Marshall and others, represented the NAACP um, before courts in um, criminal cases throughout the South. In 1988, Franklin H. Williams was tasked to conduct a comprehensive study of the uh, court system. I'm looking at Irina Mendelssohn because she knows about comprehensive studies of the New York State court system. Uh, and so he was tasked to complete this program, excuse me, this uh, study on minority representation and the treatment of minorities in the court system. As a result, we have the Franklin H. Williams Commission, an independent 
permanent judicial commission. It is dedicated not only uh, to ensuring racial and ethnic equality in the court system, to eradicating systemic racism in the court system, but also to educate and inform uh, about issues confronting the legal system and society. And programs such as this are in accordance with our mission. As a black female entering the practice of law in 1981, I was aware of Judge Motley. Uh, I knew she was a judge on the Southern District of New York. I did not know, however, that she wrote the original complaint in Brett Brown v. Board of uh, Education, did not know that she was the first black woman to argue before the US Supreme Court, didn't know the integral role she played with Thurgood Marshall, Fred uh, Franklin, Williams, Robert Carter, and others in the civil rights movement. Didn't know that she was actually the first black woman appointed to the federal judiciary. I didn't know that she served as the borough president of Manhattan and that she was the first woman to hold that position. An office she held prior to being the first black woman to sit in the Senate in New York. On a more personal note, I did not know that her parents, like my grandparents, were immigrants from the Caribbean, or as we used to say, we're West Indian, but we don't say West Indian anymore for whatever reason. So programs such as this highlight the achievements of individuals who I refer to as hidden figures, individuals who have been long overlooked uh, for their brilliance, their achievements, and their sacrifice. Despite the efforts of some, their achievements cannot and will not be erased. Banning books or curtailing certain curriculum will not erase Rosa Parks. It's not gonna erase Ruby Bridges or Emmett Till or Dr. Martin Luther King. It's not gonna happen, okay? We're not Stalin where you know, he used to erase the uh, individuals in the photographs so they no longer exist. That's not gonna happen because what we are and who we are are part of our soul, okay? It is who we are. It is what makes us who we are. It is our very being. We will continue to teach our children and our grandchildren what it means to be black, to be Latino, to be LGBTQ in America. And it is programs such as this that will achieve that goal. In the beginning of this book, Civil Rights Queen, the author includes a poem from Judge Motley when she was 15 years of age. It's like right on the first couple of page, pages. It's called, Listen Lord from the Slums. It's a bit dark because she talks about how God could not have made this world as it is filled with misery, mountains of sin. She ends by saying, no longer am I sad for someday when I close my eyes for good, I'll see good in glory, the world the way I would. Throughout her life, Constance Baker Motley made the world the way she would. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Susan Coleman, president of the City Bar. And on behalf of the City Bar, I am delighted to welcome you here. And thank you uh, as well to the National Association of Women Judges um, and the Williams Commission for all their work uh, in bringing this evening together. In January, 1995, nearly 30 years ago, I had the great good fortune to appear before Judge Baker Motley in a pro bono case, representing a plaintiff in a four day trial which successfully settled at the close of testimony due in no small measure to Judge Motley. We represented Lester Puckett, a homeless black man who lived at Camp LaGuardia, just outside of Chester, New York, who like many other homeless Camp LaGuardia residents had been arrested for violating Chester's open container law while carrying a cup of Sprite soda. There had also been attempts to prevent the Camp LaGuardia residents from voting 
purportedly because they had no mailing address other than the shelter. Mr. Puckett sued for false arrest as well as various other constitutional violations. The suit was filed in Manhattan. And when our adversary moved to transfer the case to White Plains, Judge Motley politely declined. In the very first conference, she asked, wasn't this, isn't this just like the so-called shuffling Sam case, a 1960 Supreme Court case, which held it to be a due process violation to arrest someone when there was no evidence of guilt. Shuffling Sam was known to do nothing more than a little soft shoe shuffle in rhythm to the jukebox. Judge Baker Motley was gracious and steadfast. And this small case, like the many landmark cases she was involved in, was just another recognition of the, her, rec of her recognition of the power of each individual to effectuate change in the world. Mr. Puckett felt that power in Judge Baker Motley's courtroom, and of course, it made a lasting impression on me. As we celebrate her tonight, that brilliant mind that used her voice to dismantle racism and uplift all, I am so grateful and humbled to be here with all of you who have carried on her legacy in countless critical ways. Nearly 30 years at this moment in our history, it is so fitting that we pause during Women's History Month to represent, to remember Judge Constance Baker Motley, a true civil rights queen. We need to channel her energy, her passion, and her legal acumen and model her work for the change we set desperately and sadly continue to need today. I am sure that she would take pride in so many of you in the room who continue her legacy and she would exhort us all to continue the fight. And with that, it is my great privilege to turn this back over to the Honorable Shirley Troutman, Associate Judge of the New York State Court of Appeals. The seats down there are important because there's a video presentation and I want our participants also to receive the fullness of it. Constance Baker Motley was the ninth of 12 children born to her parents, Willoughby, Willoughby and Rachel Baker, who Constance Baker Motley became has much to do with her upbringing by West Indian parents who immigrated from Nieves. Her parents viewed the world through the lens of British subjects. In her disciplined home, she was reared to be cultured. She was raised to believe in the value of education and her upbringing was further strengthened by being part of a proud, tight-knit West Indian community in New Haven, Connecticut. But she did not initially view herself as a member of the African-American experience. She knew that her father looked down on Southern Blacks for what he viewed as their voluntary subjugation to segregationists. In addition, many in the West Indian community of which she was a part of viewed their race relations with the white community as being superior to that of Southern Blacks. Despite some evidence to the contrary, which included disparities in housing and the fact 
that's similar to other Black people. Their employment opportunities were limited to working in service jobs at Yale as domestics until factory work became available after World War II. Remarkably, despite her family's economic challenges, Constance Baker Motley's nurturing environment enabled her as a teenager to imagine herself becoming a lawyer. She drew additional inspiration from the nation's first black female judge, Jane Bolin, who was appointed to New York City's Domestic Relations Court and local black attorney, George Crawford. As a young woman, Constance Baker Motley, unlike her friends, was not satisfied with occupying her time with only social engagements. As a result, she sought out opportunities for civic engagement, even though it required her to associate with adults, an experience in which she excelled with the help of her height and her mature manner in which she conducted herself. In fact, it was Motley's ability to articulate her views in the presence of adults that caused her educational benefactor, Clarence Blakesheet, an industrial magnate and philanthropist to fund her college education and law school. It was not until she journeyed by train to begin her freshman year of college at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, that she came face to face with the harsh realities of Jim Crow laws and the experience of being African American in the United States. When she crossed the Mason-Dixie line, she was mandated to board a segregated train car. It was designated, quote, for colored only in order to complete her trip. However, during her short stay at Fisk, she discovered a rich and diverse black culture that was unfamiliar that she had re I'm sorry that she had previously been unfamiliar with ultimately she would finish her undergraduate studies at NYU and thereafter obtain her law degree from Columbia Law School as a young law student Constance Baker Motley's legal future came into focus just prior to graduation when she met and then interned for the larger than life Thurgood Marshall at the NAACP, NAACP Legal Defense Fund, colloquially known as the LDF. Unlike the law firms that cavalierly rejected her applications for employment. Marshall hired her without reservation, even despite his, his then holding some antiquated views about the social roles of women that were unfortunately common at the time. To Constance Baker Motley, however, he was the one that gave her the opportunity to practice law. And so upon graduating law school, she became fully immersed in civil rights litigation. The LDF's legal strategy for eliminating the pernicious doctrine of separate but equal was to first attack the denial of admission to blacks at state owned professional schools. It was seen as a winning path to take because there were no such schools 
in existence for Blacks. When Constance Baker Motley traveled to the South to litigate on behalf of the LDF, she quickly realized that she was engaging in dangerous work due to the visceral hatred she encountered from not only local citizens, but also from lawyers and judges. During one of her cases, while litigating down South, opposing counsel refused to call her Mrs. Motley, which was the respectful title accorded, accorded to married women at the time. Despite the danger she faced, it was not in her nature to allow anyone to disrespect her. So she called him out. And the compromise that resulted was for opposing counsel to refer to her as the counsel from New York. In the end, however, Constance Baker Motley earned enduring respect as a litigator by winning nine out of 10 cases that she argued before the US Supreme Court and contributing to the success of many more cases, including Brown versus the Board of Education. But it is worth noting that not all of the time she spent at the LDF was without controversy. She discovered that she was not afforded the same title or pay as other similarly situated attorneys in her office. So long before the phrase, know your own value was coined by Mika Bershensky, Constance Baker Motley determined what her value was and demanded remuneration commiserate with that value. And as a result, received it. Yet some argue it was due to her gender that she was passed over to head the LDF after Marshall's ascension to the federal bench. Fortunately, I can say now with pride, three of the last five people to head the LDF since 1993 have been women, including its current leader, Janae Nelson, and the incomparable Sherilyn Eiffel and Elaine Jones. But returning to our subject, there is no question that in order for Constance Baker Motley to marry, she had to find someone who would love, honor, adore, and respect her as a person and as an independent professional woman. That is precisely what she found in Joel Motley Jr. He was competent enough to accept her need for an egalitarian marriage, which allowed her to be a wife, mother, attorney, politician, and judge who had to routinely travel around the country with men and work long hours. She made the life she wanted work by hiring help to take care of her home and child. However, what allowed her to successfully navigate her many roles was the fact that she had a husband who was accomplished in his own right secure in the knowledge that it was he she would ultimately return home to. Constance Baker Modley navigated her eventual interests into politics like she did when attacking her civil rights cases, which was with a tactical plan. As a result, she was elected the New York, to the New York State Senate and elected as Manhattan borough president. However, her stint in politics was short-lived due to her appointment by President Lyndon Johnson to the Southern District 
of New York in 1966. She became the first black woman and only the fifth woman in the nation to be designated to serve as a federal judge. Although her talents eminently qualified her to serve at higher levels of the federal judiciary, she was prevented by both racism and sexism from doing so. Nevertheless, as a federal district court judge, she served with distinction, rendering decisions that greatly increased opportunities for women and people of color. Throughout her career, Motley paved the way for women in the 20th century to achieve progress that many at the time viewed as impossible. She did so by using her legal acumen as a trial attorney to break down barriers to equality for all. And then she shattered the glass ceiling of the federal judiciary. Moreover, long before the National Organization of Women's Birth in 1966, she served as an exemplar of how to successfully achieve a work-life balance. Today, we celebrate Constance Baker Motley and thank her for paving the way for all who have gathered here today. In doing so, we keep her torch lit so that generations to come will know her name and seek to follow her trailblazing career. I now present to you Constance Baker Motley in her own words. I rejected the notion that my race or sex would bar my success in life. When I was 15, I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. No one thought it was a good idea. Lack of encouragement never deterred me. I was the kind of person who would not be put down. Columbia Law School men, were being drafted. And suddenly, women who had done well in college were considered acceptable candidates for the vacant seats. The women's rights movement of the 1970s had not yet emerged. Except for Bella Abza, I had no women supporters. Sexism, like racism, goes with us into the next century. I see class warfare as overshadowing both. The constitution as originally drawn made no reference to the fact that all Americans were considered equal members of society. Affirmative action is extremely complex because it appears in many different forms. There appears to be no limit how far the women's revolution will take us. In my view, I did not get to the federal bench because I was a woman. If background or sex or race of each judge were, by definition, sufficient grounds for removal, no judge on this court could hear this case or many others by virtue of the fact that all of them were attorneys of a sex often with distinguished law firm or public service backgrounds. I never thought I would live long enough to see the legal profession change to the extent it has.
Our next speaker, Justice Betty Weinberg Ellerin, requires no introduction. She has been an advocate for racial and social equality since the early years of her youth. And in her latter years, has never ceased in those views while also embracing equality for the LGBTQ community. In addition, like our honoree, Justice Ellerin also was the first woman to shatter glass ceilings during her professional career, which includes being the first to serve as presiding justice of the appellate division first department. However, most importantly, she has always been keenly aware of the fact that although being the first is important, it is crucial that you not be the last. As a result, she has never ceased from championing the causes of women. And in doing so, she has established a legacy that will benefit many generations to come. At this time, I present to you Justice Betty Weinberg Eller. Thank you so much, Shirley. Wasn't the preceding unbelievable? I tell you, I am almost struck speechless, but I do have the ability to speak a little and will, of course. When I went through Judge um, Motley's bio, I discovered she was eight years older than I was and that she had grown up in New Haven, Connecticut. Well, um, the, ironically, at that time, um, oh, from the time from the time I was four years old until the end of my first year at high school, I lived in small Connecticut towns about ten or twelve miles from New Haven. Well, it was during this uh, 1930s, early 40s, and it was a very nice place to go to school, and I enjoyed that. The only thing was uh, I found tremendous anti-Semitism in uh, those little communities. The words dirty Jew were something I've heard many, many times. Well, that had an enormous impact on me. Uh, <laughs> while uh, the experience made me uh, more strongly committed to my own background and traditions, it also sensitized me to bias against others and uh, particularly against Negroes as they were then called. And that has stayed without, with me throughout my life. And I have been an activist in that regard to this day. We viewed New Haven as the big city, and we really loved going there. And it was a city that had many minorities, uh, as well as Yale University. Well, Judge Motley went to an integrated school and apparently had a very pleasant childhood, as you heard, until she was turned away from a skating rink and from a beach because of her color. Uh, that caused her to join the local Connecticut ch um, chapter of the NAACP, uh, which presaged the extraordinary future in that organization that she ultimately had. I learned um, today uh, that she indicated at age 15 that she wanted to become a lawyer and that her people thought she was crazy. Well, I decided at age 12 I was going to become a labor lawyer and save the working classes. Well, that did not go over too well in my family. My mother, oh, you'll never get married, was aghast. And my father, 
um, who had, was depression scarred said, listen, a teacher, a secretary, they always make a living. But a lawyer, they starved to death during the depression. And indeed, many of them did. But do children ever listen? I went my way and I worked my way through and I did become a lawyer. Um, now, during my period, I went to NYU Law School. By the way, I, this is, I think, worthy of note. Um, when I graduated in 1946, it was the end of World War II. So even though I had been the valedictorian of my high school class, I had no guidance and I wanted to go out of town. So I got a scholarship to Indiana University, which I thought was terrific because we had friends in Connecticut where the kids went to those schools, Indiana, Ohio. So I get out there, gorgeous campus. That was the first week. The second week I find out it's Klan territory. Well, <clears throat> This little Jewish girl from New York did not take too kindly to that. And of course, I was constantly marching, arguing, what have you. By the end of the year, I got out of town, out of my system, and came to NYU, which I loved. And I did college and law school at NYU. While I was in law school, those were the days when the civil rights movement was really at its height when Connie Motley uh, was you know, leading the fight when she was down there. Um, 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 uh, actually, she went originally uh, to represent um, the colored school teachers, women's school teachers, uh, in um, an effort to get them pay parity. And ironically, that led her to fight for pay parity for herself at the NAACP. Uh, she, her record was unbelievable. Um, I mean, she won, I, as you heard, nine out of 10 cases in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, when she went down to Mississippi, uh, I don't have to tell you how she was treated. You heard part of that. It was even worse than that. She couldn't get a place to stay, uh, to live. Uh, some a black family took her in, and some of the white store couldn't, uh, keepers wouldn't even sell uh, her food. Um, well, I will say this: to see a woman lawyer, a black woman lawyer, uh, facing hostility and worse, achieve those successes was inspirational and enhanced my own desire uh, to succeed, achieve, and do good. She had that influence because of her example. Uh, when I graduated from law school in 1952 and began the, uh, the job search, I was not interested in joining a, law a Wall Street firm, nor were they interested in me, nor, unfortunately, uh, were the labor the uh, labor union um, firms? I ended up at a small maritime firm. Well, that was pretty good because it and um, they had cases in the federal court. So there I was, this very young lawyer going into the federal court. Now the the grandeur of that court on Foley Square could be very intimidating. And of that time, of course, there were no women judges at all in that building. Uh, and most of the judges were stern white men. And when a case was called, and when I walked up to the podium to answer the calendar, I would get, you know, we don't have secretaries answer the calendar in this court. Or the nice ones would say, are you a lawyer? But that was how it was, and in a sense, that was how we took it. Ultimately, uh, after a, few, a couple of years in that firm, I took another path. <clears throat> I was fortunate and got a job as a law clerk to a judge in a court that no longer exists, the city court of the city of New York that had maritime uh, jurisdiction. 
And the fact that I was a woman was significant enough um, to earn an article and a photo in the Bronx edition of the New York Post. It was a different paper in those days. Uh, and when my judge was elected to the Supreme Court, he took me with him as his law clerk. And all of the male law clerks, I was the only woman at that time, rushed in, Betty, you know, you're the first woman ever to be uh, a law clerk to a regularly elected the Supreme Court judge in the state of New York. That was in 1965. Boy, thank heaven, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, significantly, it was in 1965 that President Lyndon Johnson wanted to appoint Constance Baker Motley to the United States Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the kickback from the Southern bigots uh, forestalled that. And ironically, he also would have appointed her to the Second Circuit. But there were bigots, in a sense, in that court as well. Notwithstanding, he persevered, and as you heard, he appointed her as the first Black woman judge anywhere in the nation. And as you also heard, her record was fantastic. Uh, prior to the, and you heard of her service in the Senate, and she was the first woman to serve as a borough president in Manhattan. And in the course of those experiences, uh, there were two women uh, who were very supportive of her. One, as you heard, was Bella Absog. Well, I'm happy to say that when I ran for the Supreme Court, Bella supported me. And the other one was someone named Horty, Hortense Gable. Many of you may remember her. She had been in the city administration under Mayor Wagner, and then she had become a Supreme Court judge. And I was the administrative judge of the city and obviously got to know her very well. We became friends. And um, one night, uh, she invited my husband and myself to dinner. And the other guests at that dinner were Constant Baker Motley and Joel Motley. Well, that was some evening. She was a larger than life person. She was extraordinary. That wonderful laugh. But more than that, she told it like it was. You know that you were in the presence of somebody extraordinary. And indeed, she was. Um, I will never forget that evening. Uh, she just had that impact. And you know, the kind of judge she was, uh, was quite remarkable too. We think of her as a civil rights lawyer and judge, but she was far beyond that. She was terrific in all kinds of cases. Over the course of my career, I know I have known a lot of very successful and um, very, outstanding men, my trial lawyers, many of them appeared before her and they spoke glowingly of her. And let me tell you, they're a pretty tough crowd. Uh, now, I want to conclude with a case that was brought before her uh, that shows how gender, gender bias can rear its ugly head, even in the highest circles. The case was blank against Sullivan and Cromwell in the Southern District um, in New York. It was brought by a woman named Diane Blank uh, under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The claim was that the firm discriminated against the employment of lawyers on the basis of sex and had been certified as a class action by Judge Motley earlier in the proceedings. Well, the defendant brought an application uh, requesting the judge to disqualify herself on the grounds of extrajudicial bias against the defendant and in favor of the plaintiff and her cause. The court, Judge Motley, in a detailed decision of some pages, decimated with meticulous precision the meritless arguments raised by defendant's counsel. And in a coup de grace, 
uh, she pointed out that there is an equal duty on the part of a judge not to recuse himself um, when there is no occasion to do so, as there is for him to do so when there is. Of course, this is, was an allusion to the fact that in many instances, judges, when an issue is raised, look to recuse themselves. They don't want to you know, be in the midst of any sort of turmoil. Not Connie Motley. She was going to do what was right no matter what. Uh, ironically, I had a similar experience some 25 years later when I was on the appellate division. Uh, and uh, we had a case of a um, gay mother uh, who had used a, a, a gay male sperm uh, to impregnate herself. When the child was about uh, eight or nine years old, that um, male, who had never supported the child, had very little contact with the child, sudden brought, suddenly brought an order of affiliation. Uh, he was ill at that time. Uh, and the case came before us. The family court judge had denied the order as not being in the best interest of the child. And uh, we sat in benches of five, and we split three to two. Uh, three of the men were to reverse, and I and another one of my colleagues, a male colleague, uh, were to affirm. And in the course of our discussions, one of my of the colleagues on the majority said, Betty, you know, maybe you ought to disqualify yourself. So I looked at him and I said, really? Well, I guess if I disqualify myself, you guys have to disqualify yourselves too. Sorry, uh, but the I... <laughs> They didn't get away with much with me, but that's something else. No, but the point is, those kinds of attitudes he continued even after, you know, uh, Connie Motley's uh, uh, situation. I don't think they would happen today, hopefully. But let me conclude by saying I will always be grateful for the extraordinary contributions that Judge um, Motley made to advancing the equal status of women, as well as people of color. She was truly not only a trailblazer, but an inspiring symbol of how one person can make life altering changes for the better for so many uh, against all odds. And I'm very grateful to have had this opportunity to speak uh, uh, in her memory. Uh, which really enhances us all. Regrettably, attorney, the Attorney General Letitia James had originally planned to be here this evening, but she could not come so, because her duties required that she be elsewhere. Nevertheless, she was gracious enough to record a greeting for all in attendance tonight. Thank you for the invitation to address you today. I especially want to thank my dear friend, Judge Shirley Troutman, for her outstanding jurisprudence, her unwavering commitment to fairness, justice, and decency within our court system. She truly is an inspiration. I also want to recognize Judge Troutman for her enlightened leadership within our community. Giving Constance Baker Motley her moment today is one but example of this. And it is fitting that we celebrate this trailblazing, glass ceiling shattering hero during Women's History Month, or as I call it, Women's Empowerment Month. This is a time <laughs> when we highlight those who have inspired, empowered, and elevated women. And Judge Baker Motley is a sterling example of the proud legacy of New York women rising up for her rights, our rights, and equality. From the Seneca Falls Convention 175 years ago, to the incredible array of participants at today's event, our state and truly our entire society has made tremendous progress because of women like Constance 
Baker Motley. Women who saw obstacles and roadblocks in their way, but knew they had the skill, the drive, and the determination to move forward nonetheless. Constance Baker Motley's legal acumen and activism helped lay the groundwork for many strong women to emerge in her wake. And as you know, I am the first African-American and Black woman to serve as the New York State Attorney General. And I know that I stand on the shoulders of women like Judge Baker Motley. It is because of sheroes like her that I and so many others have been able to rise and serve our community and our state. She truly is a role model for each of us and our ongoing quest for justice. Her constant push for equality and to move us forward is a constant source of inspiration to me, as I know it is for each of you. As your attorney general, your friend and your sister in the struggle, I am so grateful to Judge Baker Motley, and I thank everyone involved in organizing this important event to honor and celebrate this true queen of the civil rights movement. God bless you and thank you, Letitia James. Respect is defined as a feeling of deep admiration for someone elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. The video montage that I'm about to share with you contains a mere sampling of women who are the epitome of the definition that I just shared with you. However, more importantly, there are many more that aren't contained in the video due to the sheer volume of accomplished women that have contributed to this great nation. The proceedings today are recorded 
And there's a glossary with respect to the women who were depicted in the video that will be posted after the program. Our moderator this evening for the segment of the program entitled A Conversation, The Legacy of Constance Baker Motley is Cheryl Chambers, Associate Justice of the Appellate Division, Second Department. Like our honoree, Justice Chambers is no stranger to being the first, which is what happened when she joined the second department. When I began planning this program tonight, she was one of the first people to sign on to the project. I will now turn the program over to Justice Chambers. Panelists, please join her. That's a hard act to follow, don't you think? They're putting it up. Tell us. What's it, whose name is that? Judge Tell. Good evening, everyone. I am, yeah, I should let you answer me. Good evening, everyone. Well, Judge. I am truly excited about today's program, celebrating the life and legacy of Constance Baker Motley. When I was a young lawyer, I met her when I had the honor of introducing her at a bar event. I was awestruck. And I am thrilled to moderate this program because it gives us an opportunity to learn about this remarkable warrior for justice who helped pave the way for a proliferation of women lawyers and judges. The challenges that she faced are still relevant today. And our expert panelists will help us grapple with finding our own path towards equality. I agree with just, just Judge, Judge Troutman about Professor Tomiko uh, Brown Nagin's book. Like everybody else, as soon as Judge Troutman contacted me, I went out and bought my copy. Um, I have to tell you, you have to read it. Put it on your summer reading list if you don't have it already. I will quote extensively from her book during our panel discussion. Let me introduce you to our distinguished panelists. To my immediate right, uh, Judge Carmen Boshan Saparic, the first Puerto Rican woman to serve on a court of record in New York State, was born and raised in New York City, attended parochial and public schools, graduated from Hunter College in 1963, and then attended St. John's University of School of Law as an evening student while teaching social studies in a junior high school in Central Harlem. She graduated from St. John's in 1967. You're braver than I am. I'll never give my date anymore. <laughs> and immediately began working at the Legal Aid Society in the South Bronx rendering civil legal services to a most disadvantaged, primarily Spanish-speaking clientele. She left the Legal Aid Society after a few years to join the court system and served in several legal positions until her appointment by Mayor Ed Koch to the criminal court of the city of New York in 1978. In 1982, she was elected to the Supreme Court in New York County, and in 1993, elevated by then Governor Mario Cuomo to serve on the New York State Court of Appeals. 
There she served for 19 years as the only the second and first Hispanic member of the court. In total, she served as a judge for 34 years. Upon her retirement from the court, Judge Separic joined Greenberg Trorick, a commercial litigation firm, but has retained a foothold in the public sector. She currently serves as chair of the New York State Board of Law Examiners, co-chairs the Justice Task Force, a body that examines the causes of wrongful convictions, and in a previous city administration, chaired the Mayor's Advisory Committee on the Judiciary. She is delighted to be with us this evening. Thank you. Judge. Annalisa Torres was appointed to the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York on April 23, 2013. She served on the New York State bench from 2000 to 2013 in the Supreme Court and civil courts and following seven years of practice in a major law firm, um, she served as a law clerk to New York State Supreme Court Justice Elliot Wilk. Judge Torres was a member of the CUNY Law School Board of Visitors from 2008 to 2015 and served on the Board of Directors of the Women's Housing and Economic Development Corporation as a director and then chair from 1997 to 2017. She was awarded the Charles Evan Hughes Fellowship at Columbia Law School and graduated Harvard College Magna Cum Laude. Next is a member of my court family. Riyad Williams is the Assistant Deputy Chief Court Attorney for the Law Department of the Appellate Division Second Department. In that role, Riyad supervises and trains about 50 appellate court attorneys in the preparation of confidential reports for the justices of the appellate division. Prior to joining the law department of the appellate division in 2006, Riyadh was a certified financial planner at Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan Chase, where she was responsible for creating wealth management plans and specialized investment solutions for her clients. I'm going to talk to you later. Um, <laughs> prior to that, Riyadh uh, worked as an associate in Morrison and Forster from 1994 to 1995. Riyadh had the wonderful opportunity to clerk for the Honorable Constance Baker Motley. Riyadh earned her AB in political philosophy with honors from Princeton University, where she was awarded the class of 1869 prize in ethics for her senior thesis. She graduated from New York University Law School with dual degrees, a JD and an MA in philosophy and was an associate editor of the Law Review. So let's get started. So what I'd like to do is begin our conversation with Judge Taparic. Um, Constant Baker Motley's persona has been described as formidable, self-possessed, imperial, and striking in her appearance. Her hair was always perfect. I haven't gotten that down. In her New York Times obituary, Motley was described as tall, gracious, and stately. Judge Separat, you also have been described as fearless, personable, race under pressure in your biography found on the Historical Society of the New York Courts website, I discovered an interesting quote from an April 1972 New York Post article when you were appointed as the first woman to head the city criminal courts law department. The reporter noted that Ms. Bonchamp uh, was 
had whose dark brown hair exactly matched her large eyes, has a quick smile, friendly manner, and carries her five foot eight height with easy, the easy grace of a dancer. I had no idea that you were a dancer. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> In the professor's book, she contends that some of these attributes that you have in common with Motley help facilitate her, her breakthrough in a world premised on masculine norms. To what degree does physical appearance, stature, and composure play a role in how women attorneys and judges are perceived? Do you think that is something that women need to be concerned about or not? Well, yes, definitely. I think women should be concerned about it. It certainly helps to be eye level. Uh, back in back in the sixties, when I was a young lawyer. But before I start, I want to um, thank the uh, um, organizers of this wonderful program. Uh, it's it's been a marvelous evening, and thank you, Cheryl and Judge Troutman and Marsha Hirsch, etc. Um, and I want to acknowledge. Ladies of the Court of Appeals, there are three ladies here present, besides Judge Troutman, Judge Rivera, and Judge Singus. Welcome. When I first started, there was only one, Judge Kay, and she had been all by herself for 10 years until I joined her. And uh, at my induction ceremony, she thanked Governor Cuomo for giving her a little sister. <laughs> I'll never forget that. And Judge Kay and I became very close friends as a result of working together in the court. It's just a fabulous court. Anyway, so as I said, it did help to be eye level, um, especially as a young legal aid lawyer representing uh, indigent uh, families who were um, being evicted from their homes, uh, representing um, women who were who were being um uh who wanted to get out of abusive relationships of uh, representing uh uh people who were looking for some type of um um either financial benefit from from welfare agencies etc and it certainly did help to establish a sense of credibility to be well groomed well dressed um, respectful, uh, but there were times when that didn't matter. I mean, remember one time I was representing a woman in a custody matter in Supreme Court. We had brought the matter as a habeas in Supreme Court, and I was told by opposing counsel, he asked me, he said, do you have children? And I said, no. Uh, uh, and he said, well, you should go home and have some children, uh, and then you'll understand what this is all about. <laughs> yeah, so, um, and and judges who, at the time, I didn't know better, right? This is the this was the 1960s, uh, who never really learned my name, never really bothered to learn my name, um, and I guess at the time it just wasn't. We weren't aware. Women were not aware of the indignities that we were uh, faced with on a daily basis, and we just sort of took it. Judge Ellerin made reference to that earlier, uh, but um, yes, I do think that. Um, women, certainly it's important to clients that you look well. Uh, they come to a lawyer's office, they want somebody to, to look like a lawyer. Uh, certainly important uh, when you make your court appearances that, that you're well-groomed and well-dressed. Uh, and certainly as a judge, even though you're wearing a robe still, uh, one, one should um, um, make an attempt to, to uh, to look presentable and to, and to look respectful. Uh, well, does that answer your question? To answer to judge? Okay. question. You know, it's funny that she would say that, and I'm gonna, my husband's in the audience, Seymour James. Um, sometimes on the weekend when I'm going out, I look like what shot out of a cannon and right. goes, remember, you have to look like an appellate division judge. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, let me ask you this, to what degree does physical appearance, again, I said to you, um, let me go back, let me ask you something else. Um, as women, we're happy um, when we 
um, you know, sort of break, um, get through the door of employment. And then we discover that gender differences can be a serious obstacle that must be considered. Let me set the table for the next series of questions. Gender linked differences in leadership style may have contributed to Constant Baker's Motley's biggest professional disappointment of her career. Um, you heard about it a little before. By mid 1961, Constance Baker Motley, who had worked at the Inc. Fund, that's another colloquial way of saying the Legal Defense Fund, for 15 years, um, viewed herself as a worthy successor to her boss. Thurgood Marshall, after uh, President John F. Kennedy nominated, nominated Marshall to the federal bench, um, there's no question that Motley's professional record made her a strong contender for the posts. But by 1961, she had successfully argued numerous cases in the federal appellate and trial courts. While Motley was considered a superb lawyer, her detractors insisted that Motley had not been a part of Marshall's inner circle, which ironically led to his conclusion that she was not ready to take over the reins of the organization. Within days of the White House, the September 1961 statement officially announcing Marshall's nomination, Inc., the Inc. Fund's executive committee had news of its own. Jack Greenberg would succeed Marshall as the general counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Constant Baker's Motley's beloved mentor had passed her over for the promotion of a lifetime. Prof the professor, Professor Nate Brown Nagan, argues that gender more likely played a role in Marshall's decision. Motley did not live up to the conventional brash, masculine style of leadership. Pointedly, no woman was in Marshall's inner circle. Well, much has changed. Women, persons of color and other underrepresented groups can find themselves at a disadvantage in hiring or promotions when subjective measures, I know some of you've heard this term, such as gravitas are used to evaluate candidates for senior roles. So Judge Separic, what's your view? Oh, I agree with that. Um, I think we've all had disappointments in our, in our careers. Um, I had a disappointment, which I'm sharing with Judge Rivera at this point, of, um, of not having been considered for a chief judge position that I felt I was qualified for uh, back in 2008 when Judge Kay retired. Um, I had been on the Court of Appeals for 15 years. I had been a trial judge for 15 years, had served in the court system for 40 years. And it was a tremendous disappointment not to be on, on the list of seven that were presented to, to Governor um, uh, Patterson at the time. And um, actually the governor himself was very upset. The attorney general at the time who was um, Andrew Cuomo was, was upset. There were no women on that list. Uh, two of my male colleagues with uh, less seniority than, than I had were on that list, but I was not. Um, and uh, that was a major disappointment. I felt, oh, you know, I felt, I guess I just didn't have the gravitas <laughs> to, to make the list. And uh, uh, it's something that still hurts and something that I, I know that uh, people in this room are feeling as well. So do you have any advice for those of us who are dealing with just that? All right, this still hurts and it's many years later, right? That was in 2008 and we're now in 2000, uh, uh, 2023. Um, uh, yeah, you just go on, you do your job, you do the best you can, you find other, other avenues. Um, I was very, very fortunate to be a judge of the Court of Appeals. <laughs> I'm a gift of great opportunity. 
uh, and I, I recognize that. And and um, I continued. I had four years left before I, my forced retirement at seventy. Uh, and um, now I, you know, reinvented myself as a <laughs> as a lawyer in a major commercial litigation firm, and I'm enjoying that. So you just move on. So my comment is um, is really um, rests with a comment that the professor made in her book. Um, she said, Motley had a mentor-mentee relationship with Thurgood Marshall. Um, he hired her as an attorney at a time uh, when the Wall Street firms closed the doors in her face and gave her an opportunity that in effect made her career. But these relationships, these mentee-mentor relationships are not always smooth. And, and they're not without complication. Um, and that's highly relatable. Therefore, I would suggest that we need a network of supporters and allies. So this is a perfect transition to you, Judge Torres. Um, Judge Torres's family has been long and prominent in public service and in politics. Uh, your father, Frank Torres, served for many years on the New York State Supreme Court um, in the Bronx, I believe, um, and was a Democratic member of the New York State Assembly. And your grandfather, which is unbelievable, Felipe Torres, uh, served as a family court judge and was also an assemblyman. So Judge Torres is writing a book and producing a documentary titled Felipe N. Torres, an Afro-Puerto Rican journey through the 20th century. Um, this book and the documentary about her are about her grandfather who was born on a farm in Puerto Rico, migrated to New York and emerged as a leader in the Spanish speaking community as a lawyer legislator and judge. It makes sense that she has an interest in Constance Baker Motley's bid for electoral office. So let's fast forward a little bit to 1964 in the months just before and after the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Motley had a nationally recognized name as well as a sterling reputation, few people, and still fewer Black Americans could claim to be as widely known as Constant Baker Motley. She was perfectly positioned for her political fortunes to rise. So Judge Tor Torres, can you talk a little bit about the circumstances that caused the Manhattan power brokers to seek Motley out to run for elective office? First, uh, thank you to the National Association of, of Women Judges, uh, to the Williams Commission, and to the City Bar for sponsoring this event. I want to start with a question. What lessons do we take away from the political process that led to Constance Baker Motley's election to the New York State Senate the Manhattan Borough Presidency, and her appointment to the Federal District Court. One, we learn how influential members of the Black community in a systematic and uh, coordinated effort mobilized both to persuade her to run and to assist her in the on-the-ground campaigning. Two, we learn that African-American leaders were not a unified bloc during the civil rights era. And we learn that backroom political deals in New York City were sometimes honored and sometimes not. In 1963, Constance Baker Motley ran into her old college friend, James L. Watson. Watson was a New York State Senator at that time, representing the Upper West Side, Harlem, and part of Washington Heights. Watson told Motley 
that he was going to run for the civil court and that he wanted her to run for his soon to be open seat on the state Senate. Motley wasn't inter interested at all. Nevertheless, Watson went to J. Raymond Jones, who was known as the Fox, and asked him to make it happen. In addition, there were several important people that Motley respected who pressured her to run. Dorothy Height, the president of the National Council of Negro Women. Dr. Kenneth Clark, a psychologist whose study was cited in the Brown versus Board of Education case. And Robert C. Weaver, uh, uh, the first black presidential cabinet member as head of HUD. So I'm going to go back to um, J. Raymond Jones. He was a powerful political figure in Harlem and he was often loyal to the Tammany Hall machine. But sometimes he sided with the re reform wing of the Democratic Party when it was to his advantage. He was known nationally as a kingmaker. Presidential candidates like Kennedy asked for his support. Notably, at the 1960 Democratic National Convention, Jones was the only member of the New York delegation to vote for Lyndon Johnson for president. And LBJ never forgot that. When Jones ran for city council in 1963, he made a deal with some reformers in the Democratic Party. He said if they would back him for the council, Jones would back the reformers candidate for the Senate seat when the seat opened up in the future. So when Watson declared that he would be resigning from the Senate, the reformers proposed their candidate. It was Noel Ellison, but Ellison was a convicted criminal. He ran, he ran numbers out of his dry cleaning store in Harlem. So Jones did not find him to be a suitable candidate and he backed Motley. Interestingly, Adam Clayton Powell backed a third candidate, uh, a Harlem lawyer. The special election was held in February 64, Motley won, and then she won again in the general election in 65. So in 64, she was in the state Senate, and for the first time, the state Senate had a Democratic majority, and there was a fight over who was going to be Democratic majority leader. Bobby Kennedy, senator at that time, wanted a conservative Democrat, a Democrat who had uh, voted against civil rights legislation. And to get Motley to support the Kennedy candidate, he offered her a deal. Support my candidate for majority leader, and I will submit your name to the president for appointment to the federal district court. Motley would have none of that. She backed the liberal candidate. Come February 1965, there's a vacancy um, for the Manhattan uh, Borough Presidency. Jones, again, supports Motley. And Adam Powell supports another candidate. Motley won. So in 1966, apparently Kennedy at some point had submitted the name. She gets a call from LBJ and he says, come to my office. So she goes to the White House and they're sitting there and he says, you're going to be a federal judge. And he picks up the phone and calls Bobby Kennedy. He, he says, um, Bobby, I, I want you to uh, talk to Judge Motley. So T. Raymond Jones took credit for the appointment. So, so what is the, the final takeaway from this? Constance Baker Motley was a political novice. She was not a backroom politician, but she benefited from the machinations of the Wheeler dealers and we're the better for it.
So as a follow-up to that, um, did Motley have to reinvent herself in order for her to um, gain the confidence of the voters? So she was a reserved attorney. She was a towering figure, a, a crusader for equality and used to being in the courtroom. When she ran for Senate, she had to be a retail politician. And so she was with the assistance of a number of people, um, Dorothy Height, Robert Weaver. Uh, they walked around with her when she was standing by the subways as uh, pedestrians were walking by and people were coming out, handing out her, her literature and asking for people's votes. It's, it's a humbling experience to ask for someone to vote for you. So I, th I think with relative ease, she was able to make that transition. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your own career. Um, were there any individuals or group of supporters that sought you out and help you to orchestrate your ascent to the federal bench? In 2009, I was an acting Supreme Court justice. I had been elected to the civil court and I wanted to get elected to the Supreme Court. And there is a ritual that you follow in Manhattan. You go to a lot of political dinners and cocktails, and you are a supplicant to the party leaders asking for their support. And so I was at an event in 2009 and this very beautiful blonde haired woman comes up to me and she says, I'm going to make you a federal judge. It was Kirsten Gillibrand. And I absolutely did not believe her. I thought she was exaggerating. But then she went up to my husband who was in another part of the room and said the same thing. She gave me her card. I never called her because I just, I just didn't believe it. So that year, uh, the powers that be told me that I wasn't qualified uh, to be elevated to the Supreme Court and that I'd have to wait my turn. So in 2010, again, I was making my rounds. There was actually a function here at the Association of the Bar. And I was talking to a group of lawyers when Kirsten Gillibrand joined the group and announced, I'm going to make her a federal judge. Again, I did not believe her and I did not follow up. I finally did get um, the Supreme Court seat and then you have to do a victory lap. Um, so the following year I was at an event and once again, Kirsten Gillibrand came up to me <laughs> and you know, said, what, you know, why is it that you're not calling me back? You know. <laughs> um, I was with a very dear old friend when when the senator came up and and she just, she just went like that. It's, you know, you gotta you gotta look into this. But then within a couple of days, I got a call from uh, Senator Schumer's office, and so it was at that point that I said, "Well, maybe this is um, real because I don't. I just didn't think that Schumer would waste his time." So. Um, the talk between the two of them and it was decided that um, Gillibrand would nominate me, but I had never practiced in the federal court. I, I, I actually had never been inside the federal court um, and uh, Senator Gillibrand nominated me. So let's take a half a step forward and then we'll go back in history and we'll talk to Ms. Williams who had the opportunity of a lifetime uh, serving as Justice uh, Baker Motley's law clerk. So I have to ask you, what was she really like? Okay. Well, first I would like to thank everyone who organized this event and thank you for having the, giving me the honor of having a few moments to talk about Judge Motley. Um, it was one of the greatest honors of my life to clerk for her. And just a way of 
give me a little context about my family. Um, my parents grew up in small town Aiken, South Carolina in the 1940s and 50s, an era of segregation. And they had told me a lot about Judge Motley, who they had referred to as Mrs. Motley, and about her tremendous exploits and how she would risk her life in many occasions to go to different places in the South to confront segregation, to confront um, laws that made it impossible for Black people to live in, under in, in inequality. So when I had the opportunity to interview with her, my parents were ecstatic. They're like, do you know who this is? <laughs> do you know who she is? And my uncles were were extremely pleased and happy. And I can remember when I had the interview and I, I walked into her office, she was seated at her desk and she was just exuded this energy of just power and of just grace. And I remember I was nervous, of course, and I kind of like squared my shoulders. I walked in, I sat down by her desk and she was a lot easier to talk to than I had anticipated. And we talked about my things on my resume and my experience. And then after a little while, she's like, well, you know, if you want the job, you know, you, and then I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean if I want the job? And I was over the moon. I was, I mean, it was an absolutely amazing experience. And I literally like kind of like floated out of her office. Um, but one of the, the most fond memories I have of the judge is I must have told her about, because my mother went to South Carolina State, which is in Orangeburg. And it's an HBCU, and the, the judge had fond memories of being in Orangeburg. And one occasion, I told her that my parents were coming up to visit, and she's like, "You know what? Why don't you invite them over? And you can, you can, you guys can come over on Saturday afternoon." And I was like, "Oh, sure." I was very, I was surprised. I was like, "This is amazing!" And she wants to meet my parents, and my parents were thrilled, and I was thrilled just for them because they had an opportunity to meet one of their heroes face to face. And she, we went over for an afternoon on the Saturday. She had some light refreshments. Mr. Motley was there. It was very relaxed. She was very down to earth. And also, I think at one point, uh, her son came over with her grandchildren who were at that point relatively young. And it was just very interesting just to see her interact. And I'd never thought of her. It's like, she's someone's grandmother. <laughs> you know, and just how you know wonderful that it, that that was just to see, and just her generosity of spirit of being willing just to spend a few few moments on a, a Saturday afternoon when I'm sure she was very busy and had a lot of things to do, just to meet my parents. So it's one of my great memories. So what was she like to clerk for? Well, I mean, to, to clerk for her, um, I got to see a lot, and she didn't exactly do like a lot of speaking about what she was doing, but I got to see her take the opportunity to mentor other um, young uh, female judges when they got to the federal bench. She would have them come to her chambers and, you know, they would have discussions, I guess, about judge things. Like we weren't exactly part of the conversation, but she would, you know, introduce them. Uh, that was an opportunity I got to then meet who is now Justice Sonia Sotomayor when she came through Judge Motley's chambers. And it was just a, an opportunity to see her in action because it was definitely conveyed by what she did that, yes, she may have been the one to break the glass ceiling, but she didn't want to be the only one. And she wanted to make sure that there were many others to come behind her. And I just see that like as an inspiration to me. And my role is, is helping younger attorneys in the second department to get them to um, mentor them and to help them and to develop their professional career as well. Very good. Sometimes I wonder what my clerks think about me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, now let's talk about the politics of Motley's nomination to the federal bench um, and her ascent to the bench. So on January 25th, as you heard, 1966, President Lyndon Baines Johnson formally announced uh, Motley's nomination for a federal judgeship. Um, the next day, a picture of Motley and Johnson appeared on the front page of the New York Times. The headline read, Mrs. Motley is chosen for federal judgeship here. The accompanying story observed that her selection had been some time in coming and there was little doubt that she would be confirmed. The perfect optics of that day 
concealed what was happening behind the scenes. Motley's stellar record did not insulate her nomination from criticism. In fact, it was Motley's famed career as a civil rights lawyer that slowed down her bid for Senate confirmation. She was punished for being a civil rights lawyer after she had done so much for her country. As we know, some have opposed the appointment of outsiders, and I'm talking about women, people of color, and other underrepresented groups to the judiciary explicitly or implicitly on the grounds that their backgrounds made them unsuited to the work and predisposed towards bias. So Judge Saparic, would you describe some instances where neutrality or uh, um, your professionalism was questioned based on race, ethnicity, sex, or any decision you made, um, and how did you respond? Well, um, I recall when I went before the uh, New York State Senate Judiciary Committee at the time, um, the governor was Mario Cuomo, but the Senate was Republican, um, and the uh, judiciary chair um, was Senator Markey from Staten Island. And I had written a trial court decision um, called Hope versus Perales, which um, I had struck a statute. I had struck a statute saying it was unconstitutional, provided for um, prenatal care for impoverished women, um, but it did not provide for a medically necessary abortion if that was necessary. So, um, the committee felt that I was a judicial activist. They felt that um, I, I didn't um, pay due deference to um, legislative intent. The intent of that statute was to curtail infant morbidity and, and infant, infant mortality. Um, they were um, fearful that I'd be legislating from the bench, et cetera. And so it, it became problematic. Uh, at one point, I um, I was sitting with the, with a, a Governor Cuomo's counsel, um, Liz Moore, and I said, uh, Liz, I don't think this is going to happen. And she said, don't worry, we have the numbers. <laughs> uh, and um, so that was that was interesting. Um, you know, that, that was a decision that I had made as a trial lawyer, which which impacted what was happening in the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, State Senate Judiciary Committee. However, I, I was uh, passed along to the full Senate and confirmed. Um, my neutrality was questioned as, as a lawyer. I remember working for legal aid. Um, it was also questioned as a judge. For a while, I was sitting in a part. It was an all-purpose part, uh, an IAS part, but I had a, a small calendar of matrimonial cases, and um, my neutrality was questioned there as well. Uh, uh, by male lawyers or, or, or lawyers um, who, who were representing husbands who heard whispering that um, I was biased on, on behalf of, of, the, of, the, of the wives, et cetera. Uh, so I remember that. And, um, and also I had a situation where I got a call from, this is not exactly a neutrality issue, but I think it's important to talk about. I, I, I got a call from a friend of a litigant who was before me, uh, and he was a um, a political person and not a lawyer. And he called me and he said that um, um, to remind me that my political future uh, could be dependent on the outcome of that case. And I I saw that as a threat um, to to my independence, and I uh, reported it to. Both counsel, um, both of them, you know, they said, "Oh, we don't know who." I was, I didn't tell them who called me. Uh, they distanced themselves from that call. Uh, I told them I was withdrawing from the case. Um, obviously, the caller was looking for a favorable disposition. I don't know what happened to the case. Another judge got the case, and I, and I didn't follow it up. Um, so it, it does happen. It does happen that one's neutrality um, can be questioned because of your ethnicity or because of your gender or because of decisions that you have made. 
um, or because of your practice. Uh, and it's interesting to note we, you know, we've all watched the um, confirmation hearings of um, Katani um, uh, Brown Jackson. Um, she was subject to intense scrutiny into into her qualifications and into her ideology, et cetera. We don't necessarily see that with with men. Um, I remember when Judge Sotomayor, whose portrait I'm looking at right now, right. Uh, uh, was was uh, she she was questions as to her qualifications and she probably had she had been on the trial court and the and the second circuit longer than anyone who was sitting on the bench uh, on the Supreme Court at the time and yet she was uh, questioned extensively and she made some comment about uh, uh, um, being a Latina uh, wise Latina one wise Latina. wise Latina et cetera and and that was I don't know that was totally misconstrued. And uh, and used against her, um, so I, I think you know women are treated differently, and minority women are treated differently, and that's it. That's it. Yeah. So Judge Torres, I'd like you to weigh in on the question, but I'm going to reformulate it a little bit. Um, do you think that the practice of a specific area of law um, should subject a candidate for judicial office to a higher level of scrutiny? The short answer is no, but I think that judges should be very robustly vetted. Um, they, they've they've got to have a, a a thick skin, and they um, should understand that their background is going to be scoured. Mm -hmm. So, Motley's fame career as a civil rights lawyer slowed down her bid um, for Senate confirmation. Um, and as I said before, although her um, credentials were outstanding, her battle for confirmation was a harbinger of things to come during her judicial <laughs> career. Um, you know, Judge Motley's confirmation process was seven months long. Uh, she becomes the first woman to be appointed to the Southern District, the first African-American woman appointed to the federal bench. And by the luck of the draw, as cases were assigned by a spinning drum, Judge Motley presided over one of the first cases testing the anti-discrimination cases of Title VII under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And I believe Judge Ellerin talked a little bit about the case. Um, that case opened up the law firm world to women. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the case, um, let me ask you just to give a tiny little tiny. description. It will be, be short. Judge Ellerin did an excellent job of discussing it earlier. Um, the case Blank versus Sullivan and Cromwell um, is brought by uh, Diane Blank, and it was claimed in her certified class action that the law firm discriminated against women in re in the hiring process and basically refused to hire women as law firm associates. Um, it was brought under Title VII, as Justice Chambers mentioned. And what happened during the course of the litigation is that the firm, Sullivan and Cromwell, moved to disqualify Judge Motley on the ground of bias. And one of the major reasons they cited was that she, quote, strongly identified with those who suffered discrimination in employment because of sex or race, end quote. Basically, in effect, they were based, they were primarily arguing that she should be disqualified because of her identity as a Black woman and as a successful former civil rights attorney. Um, in response and in rejecting the defendant's motion to disqualify, uh, Judge Motley uh, wrote in pertinent part, uh, indeed, if background or sex or race of each judge were by definition sufficient grounds for removal, no judge on this court could hear this case or many others by virtue of the fact that all of them were attorneys of a sex, often with distinguishing law distinguished law firm or public service backgrounds. So, Judge Separic, do you think a change of mindset is required when making the transition from an advocate to a jurist. 
Well, um, I didn't have that issue because I had been um, chief law assistant in the criminal court for six years. I had been in a neutral position um, working with judges, et cetera, rendering bench assistance. Um, but my recent experience as chair of the Mayor's Committee of Judiciary brought this back to me. Uh, we interviewed a lot of people who were district attorneys, a lot of people who came from legal aid society or had been defense lawyers for their entire career. And we also, uh, we, we always inquired of them whether they could make the transition, whether the fact that they were prosecutors or the fact that they were defense attorneys would make it difficult for them to, to, be, to be a neutral. Uh, and we, you know, we questioned them very carefully on that because we wanted to make sure that they could um, be, be fair. Um, so I know that sometimes people feel that they have to bend over backwards to be fair, that it want to be perceived as favoring one side as opposed to the other. Uh, but, but I think for the most part um, um, that people who were sent to the bench uh, know what their role is and, and they have to put their biases behind them if they have any biases. I mean, we instruct juries to do that. So certainly judges have to do that as well. And, you know, we all have biases. Uh, and uh, um, so I don't know that they really have to change their mindset, but they just have to remember that, you know, they, they're not, they're no longer advocating. Uh, doesn't mean that they can't assist in settlement negotiations, et cetera, that they can't, that they can't help pro, uh, pro se litigants um, uh, lead their cases, but um, they just have to remember that they, they are neutral and that they cannot show any bias or favor. So knowing that um, judges are subjected to identity-based scrutiny, yes. Is it possible that those judges might feel constrained um, to prove their competence and demonstrate their impartiality such that that could undermine ingenuity and the pursuit of justice? Well, it's possible. Uh, hopefully it doesn't happen too often. Um, like I said before, that I know maybe a judge might decide to go in the other direction um, just to, to prove his or her impartiality. Uh, but um, I think in the end that that most judges, at least hopefully most judges, um, you know, will set that aside and and uh, and, and be fair and, and, and down the middle. Uh, I think that's what we've all tried to do. And everyone here has tried to do, <laughs> many judges in this audience. So this is a perfect transition to you, Judge Torres. Like Judge Motley, um, you've presided over cases um, involving issues touching on race, ethnicity, and gender. Um, we have a lot of judges here. Would you offer them some advice on how you adapt and adjust to fight the good fight of advancing equality and justice for all? Well, I think that, that Judge Saparic um, has summed it up. You've got to come to the job with an open mind and mindful that you carry biases. And the, and the question is identifying those biases so that you can put them aside. So <clears throat> I'd like to explore another decision um, by Judge Motley that also opened up the workplace for women, Lucky versus Kuhn. And I'm so used to asking Ms. Williams for information on cases. I'm going to ask you to give us a thumbnail sketch of the case. Sure. And as I was reading this uh, opinion, it was really interesting to me because I am a baseball fan and I was kind of shocked to learn that uh, what the uh, the baseball commissioner's policy was at the time when uh, Ms. Lucky and the, her a publisher commenced this action. And basically what happened is that um, uh, she and her publisher commenced this action against the defendants, which included the uh, then Major League Baseball Commissioner, Bluey Kuhn, um, the commissioner of the American League, and the New York Yankees, among other defendants. And what they were seeking was they were seeking injunctive relief to prohibit the defendants from enforcing an order of the commissioner, which prohibited female sports reporters from 
entering the locker rooms of Major League Baseball teams, specifically female reporters. Um, and what was undisputed is that all accredited female sports recorded, reporters were excluded from the Yankee clubhouse at Yankee Stadium solely because they were women. That was the sole reason. And in support of their policy, and the defendants argued, I guess really there were three reasons for this. One was to protect the privacy of those players who were undressed or who are in various stages of undressing and getting ready to shower. Two, to protect the image of baseball as a family sport <laughs> and preservation of traditional notions of decency and propriety. Now, the judge in, in granting the plaintiffs a relief that they sought determined that this uh, policy by the baseball commissioner violated the equal protection and due process clauses of the 14th Amendment. Um, and in addition, what ended up happening is in March of 1979, the baseball commissioner, Bowie Kuhn, then directed all Major League Baseball teams to allow equal access to all reporters, regardless of sex. So <clears throat> Lutke versus um, Kuhn is one of the most controversial cases that Judge Motley decided for which there was a backlash. And according to Professor Brown Nagin, cemented her reputation as a friend of civil rights on the bench. So Judge Saparic, in 2022, um, Crane's New York Business named you on its notable 2022 Hispanic leaders, um, citing your professional accomplishments and your record of power change. You're not only a first, but you're an influencer, which means throughout your career, you've moved the needle. So Professor Nate Proud Nagin poses the question, is justice truly blind, rendered without regard to wealth, race, sex, or other background characteristics? Does this depict reality? And does diversity improve the quality of justice? I, it's a lot to unpack. I'm willing, I'm willing to answer that, but I see somebody giving you. So oh, they give me a timeout? Okay. How many minutes? I'm sorry. I can't see back there. I can't even. Oh, my. Well, it says one minute. One minute. Well, we're there. We're there. We're there. This we're is the there. last question. All right. Justice is not truly blind. Um, we all know that we've been made aware of the, the racial inequities uh, in the court system. Um, we were made aware of that by Secretary Jay Johnson several years ago in his report. And happily, reforms have been implemented by the court system through uh, offices of judge, um, she's not here now, Edwina Richardson Mendelssohn, and also the Franklin Commission um, has, has been working on this as well. Uh, we have mandatory racial bias training now for, for judges, for court employees. Jurors get to see uh, a film on um, implicit bias. Uh, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion is working to promote a diverse uh, and inclusive workforce. Um, and the aim is to uh, eradicate systemic bias and diversify the bench and um, um, the, the uh, uh, workforce as well. Uh, I, I myself co-chair um, was Judge Deborah Kaplan, the Justice Task Force, and right now we are uh, involved in examining the causes of, um, um, of racial disparity in the criminal justice system, and we're making recommendations regarding jury selection, sentencing, initial charging decisions, diversion programs, et cetera. Uh, so diversity does improve the quality of justice, and... Um, and, and and definitely one's perspective and life experiences that that diverse judges bring to the bench are, are very important. Um, is my minute up? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm gonna stop here. And I think we have a responsibility to be just and fair what we understand that our decisions and our opinions may be unfairly scrutinized. 
is the price of admission. So I want you to give our panelists who worked very hard a round of applause. All right, have a good evening, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, where did my notebook go? Oh, maybe someone picked it up. I don't have it. <laughs> oh, yeah. My notebook, it was here. <laughs> Judge Chambers, did you pick up Judge Chambers? Did you pick up a notebook? Oh, I thank you all. It was an ambitious night. You were an excellent audience, but the person that we did this for tonight was certainly deserving of this. And let me say, I want to thank my sisters-in-law from the Court of Appeals, Senior Associate Judge Jenny Rivera, and Madeline Singles. I thank them for coming and supporting this program and for being supportive colleagues in general. To the sponsors, the presenters, and our moderator, thank you again for giving of yourselves and your time to make tonight a success. To those in attendance, Thank you for being a part of a celebration of Judge Constance Baker Motley. It is my sincere hope that after tonight, each of you are now as devoted as I am in ensuring that our honoree's name is continually lifted up as part of American history for what she has done to ensure equal justice for all. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't take the time to acknowledge the program committee. However, I also want to give special recognition to my assistant, Michelle McCullough, for her technical assistance with the program booklet and the amazing respect video, in addition to producing the voiceover recording for In Her Own Words, which was produced by our own Mary Nicholas Brewster, last but not least. I thank Carlene Dennis for her assistance with all things big or small. Great ideas come to life with the assistance of talented people. And I am fortunate that I had, that I worked with the best. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>